Ladies and gentlemen, a rabbi, a Christian, and a cardinal walk into a bar. Please welcome founder of the Jack Brewer Foundation, Jack Brewer, host of the Church and Culture Radio Show, Deal Hudson, Rabbi Shlomo Hyam, and your moderator, host of It's Not About Us on CPAC Now, Elaine Beck. Stand to your feet really quick as we go to the throne and honor God. Uh, every head bowed, all eyes closed. Father God, we come to you humbly, the Lord Jesus, and ask that you bring your Holy Spirit upon this entire room, Father God. Blessing the slaps, Father God, CPAC, and everyone that has anything to do with this event, Father God. Give us the strength through your word, Father God. And everything that we say, let it not be of us, but a representation of you. I ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. You know, nothing like bringing God right into the room and into our hearts and opening with a prayer because that's what we're here to talk about today is our wonderful Lord and how he serves us every day throughout the world, not just this country. So welcome to everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful time at CPAC this week. And um, I'm very pleased to be able to sit here with these wonderful gentlemen that all represent different um, religious uh, backgrounds, but are all serving one God that we all love so much and rely on. And as the name of my show is, it's not about us, it's because it is about our God. Amen. So um, it's my pleasure to get to uh, introduce these wonderful gentlemen. and. Um, I'm going to start with um, Rabbi Shlomo, and I want you to know that last year when we went to the CPAC in Israel, and it's a, it's a wonderful place to go, let me tell you. When we went there, I met a, a partner of his by the name of Yehuda. He introduced me to the rabbi, and it's been a growing relationship between CPAC and Israel and they are now working with us as well. So welcome, Rabbi Shlomo. Thank you so much. And next we have Deal Hudson, and he was the co-writer uh, with um, Matt Schlapp on the, on the a wonderful book that they wrote called The Desecrators. And uh, if you haven't read it, please read it. I read it, and I'm telling you, they really hit the nail on the head with what the desecrators are about and, and, and what we need to do to make things better in this country. And then of course, uh, Jack Brewer. Um, Jack is a, uh, was a, a football player. Come on, you, you go ahead, you can, you can let him know how much you appreciated what he's done. But moreover, what he's doing right now is so wonderful, he is, um, actually working with AFPI's Center for Opportunity. He also has done so many things. I was uh, joking with him backstage about how uh, he even played for the Cardinals, and I'm from Arizona, so uh, I love all of that, and, and so many of us follow uh, football. So, But what you're doing now is, is such an amazing thing, and um, I'm, I'm gonna start with Deal, though, on the questions. <laughs> Deal's like, what is it? <laughs> so, Deal, let's start with you. There has been widespread rioting, looting, and political violence in America the last few years. What are the spiritual implications of the desecrators on American culture? Well, that's a great question. Thank you. And the rioting, the looting, the pulling down of images of great men and women who have made this country who have created its basic institutions serving the common good is exactly what desecration is. Absolutely. The word desecration is used most often when someone goes into a church, breaks a window, pulls down a statue, messes up an altar, or even disturbs uh, the act of worship itself. And desecration, what Matt Schlapp and I uh, wrote about in our book, 
is precisely the act of attempting to destroy what is sacred, our human sacredness, the sacredness of human life, the sacredness of community, of the uni unity and brother and sisterhood we have all over this nation. There is a sacredness to our patriotism, to love of our country. And I want to say this. We talked a little bit about in our meeting together about the Catholic Church. I am a former Southern Baptist minister turned Catholic. <laughs> but I want you to know that between evangelicals and Catholics, we have a lot in common. In fact, in the 2022 election, uh, 76% of evangelicals for, voted for tr President Trump. 50% of all Catholics voted for Trump. But when you look at those who went to mass regularly, 59%. I'm going to add one number to that. In the entire electorate, Catholics stand for 12%. Evangelicals for 12%. That's 24%. We come together, we can win. We must Amen. pray for each other. We must honor each other. Mm -hmm. We must see the good in each other. And not immediately because of certain headlines, we're all familiar with that, come to the conclusions that Catholics aren't powerful, aren't, don't have influence, that they can't go arm in arm with our evangelical brethren. I was in charge of Catholic outreach in, in Bush's first two election campaigns. Ralph Reed was in charge of evangelicals. We partnered and we won. That's what I hope you'll take away from at least what I'm saying today, if not from this entire gathering. Together we can win. Amen. We have to pray and we have to be positive about one another. Thank you, Deal. Very good. Um, next, we're going to go to Jack. Jack, um, uh, being a... Um, excuse me, you head up AFPI Center for Opportunity now. What opportunities are we missing out on because of this spiritual darkness that has taken a hold of our youth? We're missing out on the opportunity to save souls. So many times we talk about politics, so many times we talk about, you know, prosperity, but we forget what Jesus talked about. Jesus told us to go out and preach the gospel to every nation, Amen. all race, colors, and creed. He wasn't talking about your political party. He wasn't talking about your ideology. He was talking about people going to heaven. And so when we talk about the cultural issues happening in our time, that's because people don't understand heaven and hell. Right. People don't want to talk about heaven and hell. We want to sugarcoat everything and wonder why we have kids that don't have a fear of God that are going out riding in the streets. While we have a country with 24 million fatherless kids. While you read the last verse of the Old Testament and God warns us that if the hearts of the fathers don't turn to the children that he will hit our land with a curse. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, we're living in that curse. And it's up to the believer to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ unbashfully. Right now, our land, right now, is cursed. When you go into public schools across America and kids can't read and write, they just had 27 schools in Baltimore, Maryland, where zero kids were proficient in any class. Hmm. In the United States of America, where we're pouring billions and billions of dollars into our education system, where millions of families across the world are only dreaming about coming to this land. Are we going to protect it? Are we going to talk about the gospel? Or are we going to talk about our feelings? Well, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then, uh, for you, Rabbi, you are joining us all the way from Tel Aviv. And uh, Jack spoke about missed opportunities. What is happening to families in Tel Aviv? So, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me all the way from Israel, and I want to bless everyone here. So happy to have you. 
So I think that that's part of the problem that we see across the world, and it's also hitting Israel a little bit less, but where we forgot to sanctify family. We forgot to take responsibility for family. It can be cool to be something else besides building a family. And I think that what we see today in Tel Aviv, ever since I, I moved there 14 years ago, part of what we preach is let's build a family, let's have children, let's educate, let's build something that, that has a future that is built on values. We, whoever held the Bible in his hand knows that the, the, one of the number one values is family, is being able to not look at the here and now, but look at the future. Look at our children and grandchildren know that we're lead, leaving behind a set of values that they will continue in the same way. And it's, it, it was said to me, I remember the first time when a couple came up to me, and they're like, uh, why should we get married? We lived together for ages and uh, we're modern and wh why do we need, and I said to them, because there's a point, there's that point in, in the Jewish tradition, it's called the chuppah, right? There's the point where they both stand under the, uh, under the chuppah and they get married. And I said, that point is the biggest message you will ever give your kids. Why? Because it's the point where you, I've never played poker in my life, but I've, I've seen enough movies where you push all the chips to the middle and you say, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly the message of building a family, is being all in to values and building and a continuation of the future. Thank you, that was a wonderful answer. Now, we, we're, we're gonna get low on time, so I need short, a little shorter answers this time, but you guys are doing wonderful, and I'm sure everybody's enjoying this, but we're gonna go a little deeper right now. Deal, are these rampant spiritual forces of the darkness signs that we are in the end times? What do we need to pray for to combat the desecrators in our culture? We should always act as if we were in the end time. Yes, I like that. Bible says we don't know when the end times will come. Bible says we shouldn't even try to figure it out. Bible says there will be an end times and there will be tribulation in preparation for it. But the point that is made throughout scripture, both testaments, is that we should be ready and what being ready means is fighting the fight, saving souls. Amen. It all begins with saving souls. Mm -hmm. You're right. Because when souls are saved, they gain muscle. They gain muscle mass. They learn to be articulate. They learn to stick their face out in places where they may get it knocked off. But that's what we have to do. We have to be bold and God will make our cups runneth over if we do that. Amen. Thank you. Jack, um, being a former NFL safety uh, to devoted philanthropists, what do you need to teach our youth to empower them to rise above their circumstances and create value verse versus destruction? We gotta bring them hope. And you only can bring them hope through the gospel. First and foremost, we have to stop putting them into these public schools that don't teach them the Ten Commandments. Amen. They don't know right and wrong. So how is a kid going to make those decisions if they don't know right and wrong? We have to start teaching our kids what sin really means. What sin means. And, he, and for adults, sin is just not the sin of commission that you commit. There's also a sin of omission. Right. If you stand on the sidelines and do nothing to protect the commandments of Christ, you are committing a sin. Amen. And so, amen. I like to say an amen. That's me. So if you are not willing to go to the depths of what the gospel teaches and preach to these children, then you are to blame for their souls being lost. Amen. The word of God says by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony is how you overcome the evil one. And the evil spirits are everywhere. And so let's empower ourselves, but start off by teaching the kids the basic Ten Commandments. What would you think the great Moses 
and Jesus would think, looking at a society that doesn't teach kids the Ten Commandments. Amen. We should be demanding every single public, private school give parents the option to give their kids the gospel of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And before, last thing, I know time is coming up. If we don't bring the paddle back in these schools, the word of God says if you spare the rod, you hateth your son. It's not for us to put our feelings and emotions on how we feel about that. Some kids need their butts whooped. Amen. <laughs> and they tearing up the streets. They robbing and they stealing and they filling up our juveniles. They need to start getting their butts whooped and being taught right from wrong. Thank you. Thank you. You know, uh, it, it's so funny. I came out here with these questions because they needed to be answered. And you guys are doing such a great job. And I know usually panels, we just, you know, talk back and forth and stuff. But, you know, the power that God is bringing with your words is so meaningful to all of us. And uh, I, it just gives me such hope. Uh, Rabbi, I'm going to finish with your last question. And it is, the family is the core of any nation. Any successful nation is built on strong, secure, and healthy families. What values do we need to restore in our Judeo-Christian culture to protect families? So I think there are three core values we need to bring back to family. And it is also to education, like you said beautifully. I think we need to start teaching responsibility, accountability, and positivity. And I just want to elaborate on all three. <laughs> responsibility, again, comes back to that thought that I'm not here and I'm not alone in this world. Right. And there is a continuation. And there will be a tomorrow. And what do I want that tomorrow to look like? And when I take responsibility for that, then I take action. Accountability is like you said beautifully, Jack, and thank you so much for sharing that, is about, yeah, if I'm taking responsibility, I will be held accountable. And if I don't educate my kids, then they will riot and they will do things that are wrong. And if I don't teach my kids right from wrong or I don't teach what building a family is all about, then it won't exist. And then we will have the cultural problems we have today. And my third point, and I think that that's something that I hope that I can just do more of, is positivity. We focus so much in this world on the negative. Amen. The culture, the education, the media just pumps into our brains day in and day out the negativity and what he has and what you don't have. And there's just like that simple lesson that I think all our religions have taught us so many times. It's just, I heard a great saying, and that's what I want to end with, is so many times we look at other people and we say, oh, the grass is greener on the other side. Mm. So someone taught me a great slogan, the grass is greener where you water it. And if we yeah. start watering our grass, it's going to be very green and it's going to be incredible. I love that. That's great. Great. Well, I'm so glad that you all were here for, to hear all of this. These are some men of God that, you know, to me, that's who I look up to. And, you know, our pastors, our ministers, our priests, our rabbis, these are the people that set the stage for all of us. And what a great way they've stood on this stage today to talk to you. And so I want to thank each of them. And I want to thank you. And I want to remind you that the one thing that, that I always talk about on my show, It's Not About Us, is the love of God and how the good things that are happening in this country. And right here at CPAC, that's one of the best things that's happening in this country and around the world. So we'll be going to Israel again this year and many other countries. Don't forget your neighbor, your friend, your children, your families of all kind. Remember, they all need hugs, they all need love, and all that love comes from God. So thank you for being with us today, and God bless you all.